Today's teaching is really a full circle moment for me, ladies. Some of you probably remember back to 2020. In fact, who could forget 2020? <laughs> 2020 was really a catalyst here for us at Prestonwood Women's Ministry because we had this very strange situation alongside the rest of the world where we could not meet for summer Bible study, which was our practice. And I knew we needed to stay in God's word. So we were kind of on a staggered schedule back at that point in the office. You know, team A would come in one day, team B the next. And so basically, I went into the studio with Jared and we would both wear a mask until the last you know, possible moment and he would turn the camera on and I would take the mask off and you know, sit it under my leg there and I would teach to the camera and then we would, we would get them back on and try and be as safe as we could. You know, that was early in the pandemic and I got in front of the camera and taught our very first online Bible study, which was the book of Galatians. Now, I wish I could tell you that was was super spirit led, but let me just tell you, it was the right length, it was fairly short. So I realized if I bombed this and I was terrible, at least it wouldn't be epically long to where people were like, oh my goodness, when is she gonna stop? And it was just something I knew we, that uh, the book of Galatians had the fruit of the spirit and I knew that was something we probably all could use during that season in the world with all that was going on. And so we taught the book of Galatians. I was a nervous wreck. My daughter came in the first time I think I talked, I mean, so fast to the point where at some point I was told, you need to take a deep breath and <laughs> slow down, okay? But one of the things that as I was preparing to teach the book of Galatians, I learned about for the very first time was the Jerusalem Council. Now, y'all know that I learn things before I teach, right? Like, I, I don't know everything. I have to study, just as I'm encouraging you guys to do every week as you go back into the scriptures, I do that just a little ahead of you. And so it was in that preparation that I learned about something called the Jerusalem Council. Well, guess what? Today, we are going to read in the book of Acts about the Jerusalem Council. And so pick up with me in Acts 15, and let's start at the beginning. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church. Let me pause for a moment. This is the mother church, okay? So Jerusalem is kind of gonna be the hub. So when they go back here, they are going back to the epicenter of where all of this began, okay? So we will uh, keep going. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Now in the book of Galatians, if you happen to do that study with us, you probably heard these Pharisees referred to as the circumcision party. That's pretty self-explanatory. These were the Judaizers that were really holding on to the idea that if Gentiles were going to be welcomed into the family of God, they needed to look like the Jews, okay? And so that is really what is at the crux of this whole council. They are trying to really parse this out and come to a unified conclusion of what it looks like to incorporate the Gentiles into this community of faith, okay? So let's keep going, verse six. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, 
bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Is anybody else happy to see Peter pop back up on the scene? You know, so much of our study about the birth of the church in the first 12 chapters really revolved around Peter. He was kind of a main character and then he disappears. So we see him freed from jail. He takes shelter at Mary's house, the mother of John Mark. And then we don't really know what happens to him again until he pops up here in chapter 15. And we are going to actually see quite a few of the old familiars here at this council. It's kind of nice to see the old gang get back together, okay? But Peter, just as a reminder, you are going to remember that Peter was very instrumental in taking the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. Remember, he, he received that vision and um, he was sent to take them and they had kind of the second Pentecost. So Peter is basically relaying this information. He's, he's reminding them of what they would have known and he's reminding them of his testimony, of how God had worked in his life and shown him his spirit going to the Gentiles. Listen, it is always our testimony that is our ally when we are advocating and sharing the gospel. And we see Peter doing just that, okay? Now, in your study this week, you'll go on and read that Paul and Barnabas um, will speak, and then James will speak, the brother of Jesus, and um, this is just a rare point in time, and so I would just encourage you, read it, read it again, keep track of who is saying what and who all was there, and really just kind of picture this in your mind. I mean, these were kind of the church meetings of the early church. You know, I grew up a pastor's daughter, and I can remember remember uh, Wednesday night church meeting where they would, there would sometimes be some uh, fairly spirited, is that a good word? Fairly spirited debate about what we were going to do and how we were going to proceed. And we see that the Jerusalem council is kind of this. They are really seeking the Lord, what they are trying to interpret what God has called them to do. So let's read what they come to. Skip down to verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Of course, Paul and Barnabas have just left Antioch, okay? So send them back to Antioch. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that. The Holy Spirit is the one calling the shots yet again. And to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sanctified to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Now, I want you to spend some time digging into this passage as we always do, but let me make a point of clarification. The requirements that we just read in this letter are not necessary for salvation, okay? The Jerusalem Council is not deciding what saves a person. The gospel has always been our only mode of salvation, okay? But they are trying to determine whether or not these Gentiles need to be circumcised. And then listen, if you might remember back to any of you who have studied in the Old Testament, the circumcision was the outward symbol of the law, the entirety of the law 
which they were expected to keep. So when they are talking about this yoke, this yoke is not just of the outward burden of circumcision. It is, are we really going to saddle these Gentiles with the entire law, which we couldn't keep to begin with? It's the whole reason Jesus came. The gospel has always been that we place our trust in Christ, who died for our sins in atonement uh, and took the death that we deserve and was resurrected to life by God Almighty. And when we place our trust in Him and we repent of our sins and turn, that is what saves us. Not any of the other things, not even these things that they have called them to in this council letter. Understand that was purely for the unification. So we do, we are called to live holy, to live set apart, okay? And so this council basically determines that if the Gentiles are going to be folded into this faith family, there, there do need to be some practices that kind of unify us. There are some things that will set us apart in the community at that time. And so those are the ones they come up with, but they do decide they are not going to burden them and saddle them with the entirety of the law. Okay. Does that make sense? The gospel speaks for itself. And listen, I would caution you, be weary of anybody or anything that tries to add to the gospel message. And if you think that doesn't happen today, get on Christian Twitter. Okay, listen, be wary of statements to say you aren't saved if this. You aren't saved if you have not met Jesus and placed your trust in him and repented of your sins. But there are a lot of other things that that are going to look different for believers. So be cautious of trying to pass that judgment. Now, we can sometimes determine that someone is not living by the Spirit. We might be able to say, you know what, they, they are on their journey. I say this often. Uh, they are on their journey of sanctification. They have not gotten there yet, okay? And listen, none of us have. But we need to remember that the gospel st stands alone and praise God for that because guess what? History... And my own experience with my own thought life tells me I would not stand up under the burden of the law. Okay, so let's keep going down in verse 30. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. I want to pause here. Did it strike anybody as odd how short the letter was? Like these are the most prolific authors of the New Testament and they are sending a paragraph, okay? <laughs> that ought to tell us something, right? That ought to tell us. The word of God stands alone. We don't need to add anything to it. Verse 31, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others. Keep going in verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we have proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. You might remember John left last time, okay? And I told you that Paul wasn't going to be happy about it. Okay, well, we're about to see. But Paul thought best not to take with them, one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. You know, I don't know if it's hard for you, but it was a little bit hard for me to picture such pillars of the faith people that we set as such an example as having sharp disagreement. Um, I'm thankful that the word of God includes this for us because I don't think any of us make it through our days without a few sharp disagreements from time to time. And here's what I wanna tell you. God used their sharp disagreement. You know, sometimes I think when we disagree with someone, we think that there needs to be an arbiter of who is right 
and who is wrong. I mean, is that kind of your mindset? That's my mindset. It's like, you know, yeah, I, it's interesting. Sometimes I'll get together with other women's ministry leaders and um, I, I feel very passionate about the way in which we are conducting ourselves as a ministry. We are going through books of the Bible, going back and forth from Old Testament to New Testament, building some biblical comprehension. I don't do a lot of topical studies. I think we need to know God's word. I'm pretty passionate about that, but I want to tell you there are other women's ministry leaders that are leading completely different than I. Now, are they wrong and I'm right? Am I wrong and they're right? Not necessarily. I want you to know God is sovereign over his church. He is sovereign over the message of the gospel. He is sovereign over the things that are going on in your life that I would have no ability to know or discern. And so he is able to use even the disagreements even the times when we don't understand why. He is able to use even the seasons of separation. Have you ever been separated from somebody that you loved? God can use that. He is still at work. Do not think for a moment that you have the ability to shake or thwart the plans that God has for you or for his word, okay? So I'm thankful to see this and we will see that he is going to use both of these people moving forward. Let's keep going in chapter 16. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy the son of a Jewish woman who was, the, who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Okay, wait just a hot minute. They are going and taking the results of the Jerusalem council. He has chosen Timothy and what is the first thing he does? Circumcises him? That's the opposite of what they have decided. Why in the world is he doing this? Does that confuse anybody else? Well, don't worry, I went down the rabbit trail, okay? Here's what we have to understand. Just as we don't add anything to the gospel, we may not add things, but we are willing to sacrifice and live in deference for it to stand prominently. And here is what we see. There were people that were gonna be tripped up by Timothy not being circumcised. And so we kind of get a clue into Paul's thinking if we fast forward about three years to the letter that he will pen to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 19, put a pen, put a little finger in uh, your, your study of Acts and head over to 1 Corinthians 9 chapter 19. It says, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like non, not, one not having the law, though I am free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. Here's something important to keep in mind. With Paul, it is gospel above all else. I hope that convicts you. It convicts me. Are there things that I have held unwilling to sacrifice for the gospel to be held high? I can think of some. Ladies, our example, what we see here today, what we are standing on the shoulders of, listen, we are in a church building at the ends of the earth. We've talked about this before. 
And that is not possible if we had not been standing on the shoulders of godly men and women and apostles and disciples that had been willing to be all things to all people so that the gospel could be held high and could go forth into the world. That is still our call today. This really convicts me, okay? Let's keep going. You're going to read in detail. Uh, but from Lystra and Iconium, they go to Phrygia and Galatia. We don't exactly know when Paul ministers to the church at Galatia. It could have been on this trip. It could have been on another time. We're a little iffy on that. That is not anything to shake your faith. It is just semantics. We know it happened. We don't know exactly when it happened, okay? But you'll see that the Holy Spirit, as per usual, is the one driving this ship. So much so that while he is in Mycenae, Paul will receive a vision from a man beckoning him to Macedonia, okay? And so they will set sail from Troas. So pick up with me in chapter 16, verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. I, I could not love this account more, okay? I truly couldn't. Please, please, please spend some time studying this. Uh, but let me just unpack it very briefly for you. First, Philippi was a military city, okay? It would not have had a large uh, Jewish population. We've already discussed that Paul's precedent would always be to go to the synagogue first. Well, there was, there was not a synagogue there. So they are, they've heard word or, or perhaps the Spirit is just leading that outside the gates of the city, there is going to be this prayer meeting of faithful people. And that is where they encounter Lydia and other leading women. Women were not absent from the early church. I want you to hear that loud and clear, ladies. Women have always, always been integral to the birth of the church and the advancement of the kingdom. And so don't for a second think that you have played second fiddle in this account in history, okay? And Lydia is a prominent prominent person there. Secondly, don't miss that the gospel is taking root in Europe, okay? I'm going to get to go. We've been saving up for years to go to Europe this summer. I am thankful the gospel has gone ahead of me, okay? <laughs> I am thankful for that, okay? Um, Charles Spurgeon says this, you will remember that Thyatira was situated in that part of the country into which Paul was forbidden by the Spirit to go and preach. Therefore, had Lydia been at home because she was not from there, she could not have heard the truth. And as faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, she must have remained unconverted. But providence brings her to Philippi at the right time. So here is the first link in that chain, okay? She believed in God, but she had an absence of knowledge. She had not heard the gospel. She had not experienced the spirit. And so the Lord has orchestrated this. Okay, we're going to keep going, but for the sake of time, we're going to skip down to verse 35. You're missing some important information, but it's pretty straightforward, and I think you will uh, have all you need with the Holy Spirit as your guide to interpret what is going on. There is going to be um, some pretty dramatic things that happen in what we're skipping. Uh, Paul and Silas are going to end up in prison. Now, this is not their first rodeo, okay? <laughs> this is not unfamiliar to them, but it is a very dramatic account. We'll see that an earthquake frees them. The jailer and his entire household will end up getting baptized. You'll read it for yourself, but let's see what happens the morning after that event in verse 35. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to us to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. 
The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. They took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. I am tired just reading all about that. But listen, God was at work. And I want to tell you, Paul had a boldness about the gospel, but Paul was also on a mission. And so do not for a moment think that he was someone who just let everybody walk over him. And I want to tell you, this encounter is going to be foreshadowing one that we will see coming again. You know, often because of Paul's status as a Jew, and of course he was a prominent persecutor of Christians for the longest time. Um, what you will see is sometimes he is not actually recognized as a Roman citizen. And that is going to be pivotal to the story. And this is one of the first places we see that show up, that there was Rome, listen, understand, they were the superpower of the world at that time. And they did not want to have trouble within their, um, within their own people because they were trying to be a world power and take over others. So they had to really keep peace within their board. So, you know, it was kind of peace at all costs. So when they realized that they had treated one of their own citizens that way, this is gonna start to get on their radar. So just put that in the back of your head and keep studying this week. Listen, there is a lot going on, a lot of things that the Lord is orchestrating for the church and the movements that we are all sitting in today, that we are the benefactors of to take place. And so I encourage you, study it, map it out, dig deep into it, ask the questions, study together, and really learn and internalize the pages on this scripture because it is worth it.